This work is protected under a Creative Commons copyright notice. Self-directed learning. What do you think of when you hear those words? As a concept, it probably seems, at least initially, pretty straightforward. Learning that someone chooses to do on his or her own. For some of you, it probably sounds like a pretty appealing concept. A freewheeling approach to learning that lets you learn what you want, when you want, at your own pace. Perhaps you feel like a ship at sea, sailing wherever you wish to go. For others, the concept might sound a little terrifying. After all, how are you supposed to learn without someone telling you what to do? What happens when you don't know what you should do next? What if you're trying to learn about a topic with which you're completely unfamiliar? Perhaps that ship at sea might suddenly feel less secure. Stephen Brookfield, one of the preeminent researchers on self-directed learning theory, is quick to point out that self-directed learning does not necessarily mean that learners are supposed to exist in isolation from teachers, instructors, or peers. Although we are somewhat conditioned to think of images of a lone worker toiling in isolation whenever we think of the word self, it is important to remember that the self in self-directed learning refers to who controls the learning situation. Brookfield offers a useful working definition of self-directed learning in his comprehensive chapter written for the International Handbook for Education for the Changing World of Work in 2009, seen here on the screen. Self-directed learning is learning in which the conceptualization, design, conduct, and evaluation of learning project are directed by the learner. This does not mean that the self-directed learning is highly individualized learning, always conducted in isolation. Learners can work in the self-directed ways while engaging in group learning settings, providing that this is a choice they have made believing it to be conducive to their learning efforts. As you can see, the major difference between self-directed learning and the more traditional teacher-directed learning is the onus it places on the learner to conceptualize and continually revisit a learning plan, rather than relying on following a preset series of instructions. That does not mean, however, that learners engaged in a self-directed learning task never make use of groups of peers, often called learning networks, or external experts, including teachers. Brookfield ma makes this point a bit later in his introduction. A recurring theme of research in this area is the way learners move in and out of learning networks and consult a range of peers. The key point is that whether or not learners choose to be temporarily isolated from or immersed within peer networks is the learner's decision. Indeed, in self-directed learning, all decisions about how and what to learn and how or whether to consult external resources rest with the learner. In the context of a self-directed learning effort, it is quite possible for there to be periods in which the learner decides it is most effective to place himself or herself temporarily under the control of an expert. At this point, we might recognize that the intuitive appeal of the concept of self-directed learning. After all, people of all ages have been learning things on their own for centuries. Curiously, though, a serious and critical study of self-directed learning is relatively recent in the literature. We have been formally studying other aspects of intelligence, such as intelligence, memory, and cognition for much longer than we have been studying self-directed learning. Perhaps this is partly because many people might feel that self-directed learning is natural or innate, that is, something that some people can naturally do. Can self-directed learning be taught? Keep this question in mind, as we shall be returning to it later. It is generally accepted that Canadian researcher Alan Tuff, now professor, professor emeritus from the University of Toronto, began the formal research movement in self-directed learning. He wrote his PhD thesis in the 1960s on the behavior of adults during self-directed learning projects. In his books such as Learning Without a Teacher, The Adults' Learning Projects, and Intentional Changes, Tuff argued that the formal learning that occurs in educational institutions represents a relatively small percentage of the total amount of learning that in adults gauge in in a given time. In other words, most adult learning occurs outside formal educational settings and much of this learning is self-directed. He wrote that highly deliberate efforts to learn take place all around you. The members of your family, your neighbors, colleagues, and acquaintances probably initiate and complete several learning efforts, though you may not be aware of it. He cl further claimed that 80 to 90 percent of all adults conducted at least one self-directed learning project each year, spending about 100 hours on that effort. But what constitutes a self-directed learning project? As you might expect, the nature and type of responses varied considerably, everything from the practicalities of learning how to use a new tool or piece of technology to conducting research on a topic of personal interest. 
Many subsequent authors have noted that early research in self-directed learning was highly descriptive, asking learners to describe how much time they spent engaging in self-directed learning, how and why they selected particular projects for personal study, what techniques they used to complete their learning projects, and how they evaluated their success in achieving particular goals. One important result of these early studies was the importance that learners placed on peers for successful completion of self-directed learning projects. Thus, although a learning project might be self-initiated, planned, and evaluated, most adults seem to rely on what Brookfield called qualified, credible peers as valuable, evaluative touchstones. These human resources could be friends, family members, neighbors, colleagues, or the traditional experts found in educational institutions or other formal institutions such as community centers. Qualified, credible helpers were seen as important sources of information, critique, and modeling of particular skills and habits. Malcolm Knowles, the most well-known adult education researcher of the 20th, 20th century and the person generally credited with catalyzing significant debate in and interest around adult education in the early 1970s, at least in North America, also wrote about the importance of self-directed learning. However, Knowles wrote about self-directed learning as though it were an innate characteristic of adult learners. Knowles felt that, tr that the transition towards a self-directed approach to learning was a characteristic of becoming an adult, and he held this transition as a hallmark of his theory of andragogy, which is known as the art and science of helping adults to learn. His characterization of adult learners as being inherently more self-directed than child learners caused much debate within the discipline of education, a debate that continues to this day. Many adult educators consider helping their learners become more self-directed to be a primary goal. If the 1970s were the decade of describing the nature of self-directed learning, then the 1980s were the decade of debating what the goals of self-directed learning should be. In Learning in Adulthood, a Comprehensive Guide, Miriam, Caffarella, and ba Baumgartner grouped the goals of self-directed learning into the following main categories. 1. To enhance the ability of adult learners to be self-directed in their learning. 2. To foster transformational learning as a central to self-directed learning. 3. To promote emancipatory learning and social action as an integral part of self-directed learning. The first goal follows naturally from the work of Malcolm Knowles mentioned earlier. Many authors have noted that this goal reflects an orientation towards humanistic philosophy, a philosophy that believes humans are inherently good and that self-improvement and being a better human should be the central goal for all human beings. Brookfield has pointed out that the first goal might reflect a particular cultural bias towards learning, stating, quote, the ideology of self-direction, of people individually pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and moving ahead with their own learning efforts, fits congenially with Western notions of libertarian individualism. It is noticeable that self-directed learning has been met with much less fanfare in cultures that prize the collective over the individual, and in which individual and group identity is fused. Goal 2 is strongly associated with Jack Mesereau's transformative learning theory, one of the major theories of adult learning. A full review of transformative learning theory is outside the scope of this video podcast, but the basic idea is that a transformative learning experience is one in which the learner has come to understand something differently. In order to have a transformative learning experience, then, it is critical to know what one's prior assumptions are, are about a particular topic. Mesero felt that the key to self-directedness was becoming critically aware of what has been taken for granted about one, one's own learning. One of the major critiques of self-directed learning is that it focuses too much on the needs of the individual learner. These critics would argue that the aforementioned goal one is too narrow and that it risks perpetuating a status quo. Thus, for many critics, an important feature of self-directed learning experiences is a link to social action, such as these students protesting cuts to arts in the Louvre seen here. These theories suggest that self-directed learning experiences should include some sort of reflection by learners on the socio-political structures in which their learning occurs and that self-directed learning experiences should lead to collective action. The 1990s focused on examining the personal characteristics and attributes of those who would engage in self-directed learning. Much of the adult education literature implicitly or explicitly links a tendency to be self-directed with positive self-efficacy. However, there has been little research that provides any evidence for a correlation between particular variables, such as level of education or creativity, with a tendency to be self-directed in one's learning. There has been greater success assessing the personality traits of self-directed learners. For example, a recent study of over 2,000 from middle school to college found that self-directed learning was positively related to high, higher GPA, personality traits such as openness, conscientiousness, work drive, and self-actualization, as well as to overall life satisfaction.
This video podcast has provided a brief introduction to the concept of self-directed learning. Although learners of all ages have undoubtedly been directing their own learning for centuries, research into self-directed learning has only been occurring for a few decades. More research is required. For example, how do cultural factors affect self-directed learning? How is the ubiquity of digital technologies affecting the ways in which learners engage in self-directed learning? Creative Commons Copyright Notice This work by Dr. Sean Bullock is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. You are free to share, copy, distribute, and transmit the work under the following conditions. 1. Attribution. 2. Non-commercial. 3. No derivative works. This license may be viewed in its entirety at the web address listed on the screen. Thank you.